Hello, and thanks for joining us today for the latest Technology Network's webinar, Walkaway Monitoring of Cytotoxicity, Viability, and Apoptosis. I'm Jack, Editor for Technology Networks, and I'm here to moderate the event. I'm pleased to have Katrin Flatcher and Tracy Warzella joining us today as your presenters. Dr. Katrin Flatcher is an application scientist at TCAN Austria. She studied molecular biology at the University of Salzburg and focused on cell biology and immunology research during her PhD. She joined TCAN in 2007 and has been involved in the development of the Infinite as well as the Spark Multimode Reader Series. Tracy received both her undergraduate and graduate degrees from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Her scientific career has included roles in applications development, field support and automation support for microfluidics, biologics, cell-based and biochemical assay technologies. Her primary focus is the evaluation of assay chemistry compatibility with liquid handling and detection instrum instrumentation. Warm welcome to you, Katrin and Tracy. Following the webinar, we will have a Q&A session and we'd welcome any questions that you may have. To ask a question, you should enter your question into the box on the left-hand side and click Submit. We will answer as many as possible during the time available. Any questions we don't have time to get to, we'll be sure you're contacted offline with an answer. If you experience any technical issues, please use this button to request support. I will now hand over to Katrin and Tracy. Oh, thank you very much, and hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Um, today, I'm going to be speaking about an application that we developed in collaboration with TCAN to measure viability, cytotoxicity, and apoptosis from the same sample well as a means to determine compound mechanism of action. So my portion of the talk today is going to address the application itself, and I'm going to be highlighting features of the Spark 10M that we use for the application. And then Katrin will be providing you with more background information on the Spark 10M and its capabilities. So I'll first start off today by touching on considerations for mechanism of action studies. And I'm going to be delving into the applications themselves by dividing them into two separate parts. First, we're going to be talking about the um, cytotoxicity biomarker and whether or not we can use it as a predictor for detecting the apoptosis window of detection. Um, second, I'm going to be talking about the idea of implementing a cytotoxicity threshold for automated injection of a caspase 3.7 reagent. And I will be discussing the objectives and the results for each one of these um, two applications as I go along in the presentation. And then lastly, I will wrap up with some general conclusions and some additional resources should you be interested in learning more information about the applications and the products that we describe here. So to begin today, um, cell biology research involves cause and effect. So we're testing a system or a treatment, and we're evaluating its impact on cell health. So causes can be anything from treatments to simply handling the cells in a certain way. And effects are wide ranging, and they can go anywhere from continued to enhance proliferation, um, detrimental outcomes, um, including apoptosis or overt cell deaths. Um, assays are often used to measure these effects. Um, you can be looking at biomarkers that are associated with things such as viability, like a ATP levels, um, membrane integrity changes, or even apoptosis um, or caspase activity. So discovering if a treatment is detrimental to the cell health um, can be a difficult task, and oftentimes there's really no simple answer. And the reason is that the biological profile um, from any treatment is dependent on a number of factors that will impact that result that you get. And I've got those um, factors listed on the right-hand side of the slide here. Um, and these are just a few, and there could be you know, many more. Um, on the top of that list is dosage. So how concentrated is the test article that you are evaluating? And oftentimes, what we'll do is we'll address this by performing a serial titration of that compound. Um, exposure time, so how long do the cells come in contact with that test article? Is it hours? Is it days? Mechanism of action, if it's even known, um, does that compound cause necrosis or apoptosis? And then lastly, cell type, is it specific to the disease state or is it a off-target cell type that you're just looking for general um, cytotoxic effects?
So if you're using an assay to measure the effects of test article treatment, it's critical to understand that the kinetics of the biomarker that you are measuring can change over time. So which biomarkers appear when are tied to the method in which the cells are dying. And what we're showing here on the slide are examples of apoptosis on the top and necrosis on the bottom. And you'll see within each section we have some cartoons of cells um, that change um, their morphology over the course of time as cell death is ensuing. And the changes that you see are dependent on the method in which those cells are dying. And then within the boxes underneath the um, cell cartoons, you'll see a series of pluses and zeros and a variety of biomarkers corresponding to those pluses and those zeros. And what that's telling you is that over the course of time, um, when there's a plus there in our little table there, that indicates that the biomarker is present at that point in time and can be measured. So the more pluses that you see, um, that corresponds to the, the increased um, amount of biomarker that's measured at that point in time. And then the zeros um, represent um, no biomarker detection um, for that particular biomarker at that point in time. So you can see here just by scanning through these charts very quickly that depending on the time, the profiles of these biomarkers change and it's important to keep that in mind when you're doing mechanism of action studies. So now if we zoom in a little bit closer or concentrate um, on these red boxes on the screen, you'll see that we're highlighting two biomarkers here associated with cytotoxicity and apoptosis and those are enzyme release and caspase activity. So when we refer to cytotoxicity um, and enzyme release, we're referring to the loss of membrane integrity and the release of that biomarker into the surrounding medium. With caspase activity, we're typically referring to caspase 3-7 activity. Now, apoptosis um, is a controlled program cell death with an increase in cellular proteins, or these caspases, that are responsible for the dismantling of intracellular processes is leading to cell death. And it's important to consider that apoptosis can take days before cytotoxicity is even um, realized. But on the contrary, primary necrosis is an uncontrolled and passive process that's mediated by the interference of cellular energy supply and direct damage to cell membranes. So necrotic cells are going to show you a measurable membrane integrity biomarker detection at that point of insult, but no detection of caspase activity as those cells are dead. They've lost the ability to go through that programmed process of apoptosis. So again, important to know that time dependence on biomarker detection is extremely important and that enzymatic cytotoxicity and caspase biomarkers, while they're definitive, they're transient in nature and they have a defined window of time in which detection can be um, achieved. So missing this window of detection can lead to misinterpretation of a compound's mode of action. Now cell viability assays um, can often be used because they help report the number of viable cells remaining and considering the caveats of biomarker degradation with these cytotox and caspase um, biomarkers in particular, um, the cell viability assays can serve as an important confirmatory control for your cell health. So we're hoping that by combining all these three assays together that they can be used to confirm mechanism of action. So it's important to note that current cytotoxicity assays that use an enzymatic biomarker for detection um, have limitations. And as a result, um, underestimation of cytotoxicity can result due to the overexposure of cells to the compounds that you're testing. Um, what's happening here is that these markers for cytotoxicity will degrade over time, and that's where um, the problems can result. So it's especially problematic when the assay that you're using to um, measure cytotoxicity is endpoint in nature. So with the endpoint far exceeding the detection window for that biomarker of interest. So if you concentrate your focus on the top of our graph here, we're showing a comparison of four biomarkers here, showing that um, they all have a half-life at various points in time. But you'll notice that regardless of the biomarker that we're showing here, that they have um, a degradation associated with them. So their half-life and their kinetics of degradation might be different, but they all do degrade. 
Now looking at the bottom two graphs, we're demonstrating that time dependence um, on the measurement of that biomarker and the window of detection. So at six hours exposure on the left-hand side, the cytotoxicity biomarker, which is that blue line, at high concentrations, we're detecting um, something happening in that sample. Um, membrane is starting to break down. Conversely, at 72 hours, shown on the right, you'll see this negative trending or this hook in the data at that same um, level, that same high concentration of compounds. And what's happened here is that our window of detection has essentially passed. So that biomarker has been released into the medium at a point earlier in time. It's degraded. And then at the time that we add our reagent, we're no longer able to detect it. So caspase activity is a definitive biomarker for apoptosis, but like enzymatic membrane integrity biomarkers, it is also susceptible to biomarker degradation. So the example we're showing here illustrates the kinetics of apoptosis um, due to trail treatment, and you'll see that there is a changing profile of caspase detection at each endpoint. So the results really do depend on when you assay for that activity. So here you're seeing that at four hours, we see maximum induction of apoptosis, and you're detecting that biomarker in solution. You can see a little bit of that biomarker at 24 hours, but past that time point, you're detecting um, below basal um, levels of caspase. So you're no longer to detect it in your, your system or in your sample. So because the caspase or the cytotoxicity biomarkers are transient, um, the assays that measure their activity are often best employed in parallel time courses until the true kinetics of cell death are, mis are understood. So considering that the compound mechanism of action is often not known, um, multiplexing, cell viability, cytotoxicity, and apoptosis assays is one way to distinguish apoptosis from necrosis, for example. Um, the timing of drug exposure and then assaying for that effect um, is imperative in understanding the biological profile of your unknown. And oftentimes, uh, time course treatment is used and often recommended to have a better understanding of the kinetics of cell death due to that drug exposure. So typical biomarker detection assays are endpoint and they're lytic in nature. So once you add that reagent to your test plate, those samples can no longer be used. So what we're showing here on the left-hand side of the screen is um, an example of what you would have to do if you were setting up a time course experiment for these traditional endpoint assays. What you have to do is set up multiple plates, multiple copies, assay at very different time points to achieve your ultimate time course um, evaluation of that compound. So in our presentation today, we're going to highlight the use of real-time assays for viability and cytotoxicity that will reduce effort, save on sample, and test compounds. So what we're showing now on the right-hand side is that by using these real-time assays, we can use one plate of cells, add these assays at the time of cell plating, and then quantify in real-time um, cell viability and cytotoxicity out to 72 hours. And what we're going to be doing here is we're going to be using an endpoint apoptosis assay at various time points to detect apoptosis in our sample. So what we're hoping is that by combining an environmentally controlled instrument with these various assays that we can make mechanism of action testing um, much easier and more walk away. So now I'm going to be talking about the assays that we used. Um, the first assay I'll be talking about here is our Celtox Green. Um, Celtox Green is a non-enzymatic means of measuring cytotoxicity, or again, membrane integrity changes. So it's comprised of a dye that's used as either an endpoint assay, so you can add that dye whenever your experiment is finished, or you can add the dye in a no-step assay, which basically means you add it at the time of cell plating. And this allows you to kinetically monitor cytotoxicity over time. So the dye becomes fluorescent when it's bound to DNA. So in the end, fluorescence is directly proportional to the number of dead cells in your sample. And that's what we're showing in the graph on the right. So again, it's a non-lytic, kinetic way of measuring cytotoxicity in real time. Our second assay today is our real-time glow assay, and this is used to monitor cell viability. So the left-hand schematic shows you how this assay works. And like Celtox Green, the real-time glow assay can be used in both a non 
our no step kinetic format or as an endpoint mode. And of course, we're focusing on the kinetic aspect of it today. So the assay is really um, consisting of two parts. There's a nanoluck luciferase and then a pro-nanoluck substrate, also called the MT cell viability substrate, that you add at the time of cell plating if you are going to be running the assay in that kinetic mode. And basically how the assay works, um, viable cells will reduce the substrate, which will liberate um, nanoluck substrate into the assay medium, where it is then used by the nanoluck enzyme to generate light. So here, light output is directly proportional to the number of viable cells in your sample. And then conversely, non-viable cells are unable to reduce the substrate. Therefore, no light is produced. Um, the right-hand side of our slide here, we're showing you a schematic that gives you an idea of the effect of cell number and light output over time. So cells, if they're healthy, will continue to grow and divide over time, consuming that substrate, generating more light. And it's important to note that if you're using the real-time glow assay in kinetic mode, that it's important to consider that different cell types are going to have a different growth rate and basal reducing potential that will impact the capacity of that cell to reduce the MT cell viability substrate. So as a result, it's really important that when you use this assay, you characterize the assay linearity with regard to the cell density for any cell line that you're interested in using. So we strongly recommend that you plate your cells at a range of cell densities, which is what we're showing here on the right-hand side, to determine the linear range of the assay for that particular cell type. So here on the right, we're showing you an example of K562 cells that were plated at various densities in a 384 wall plate, monitoring luminescence over time. And and you'll notice that the more cells you have in there, the sooner that your signal will plateau. The fewer cells, the more linear the assay. So for this particular assay, it's best to err on the side of using fewer cells as a way to ensure that you don't deplete that substrate and that you can achieve linearity throughout your experiment. So the last assay that we used is our caspase 37 assay, and we use that for measuring apoptosis. So here, um, how this assay works um, is that if present, the caspase 37 will cleave a proluminescent DEVD luciferin substrate. And what happens once that substrate has been cleaved, um, active luciferin is created, and then that luciferin is quantified in a firefly luciferase reaction to produce light. So in this case, Luminescence is directly proportional to caspase 37 activity, which is definitive for apoptosis. And that's what we're showing here in the graph on the right. So with increasing concentration of our compound, we see more apoptosis induction, more luminescence is detected. So an important thing to note about the caspase assay is that this one is lytic and it's endpoint in nature. So unlike the previous two assays, once we add this one to the well, it lyses the cells and we can no longer use those samples for any further analysis. So we know that cell death results from caspase activation. And with a focus on multiplexing for determining mechanism of action, in our first experiment, we wanted to know if changes in cytotoxicity indicate that apoptosis is occurring. And can this change in cytotoxicity be used to identify a window of apoptosis detection? So our first experiment, we wanted to test in a time-dependent manner, the um, dose effects of a variety of test compounds on K562 health. And we wanted to see, um, did they induce apoptosis? Were they cytotoxic, et cetera? Um, K562 cells, um, if not familiar, are a model for human CML, chronic myelogenous leukemia, and they contain a hallmark bcr able kinase translocation. So the compounds that we chose in our evaluation, um, majority of them targeted the bcr able And then we had some control compounds in our panel that were either just pan kinase inhibitors or were just generally cytotoxic compounds. 
So we also wanted to use a Spark as an environmentally controlled cell culture incubator and quantify viability and cytotoxicity in real time. And our ultimate goal was to develop a more walkaway process in um, evaluating cytotoxicity viability in apoptosis. So we also wanted to take into a, an account that Spark has the ability to lift the lid off of our plate and inject our reagent, our caspase reagent, into our plate for endpoint apoptosis analysis. So it's important to um, remember that in our first experiment here with the injection of our caspase reagent that we dictated when at what time point that reagent was going to be added into our test plate, which is a typical way of doing a, um, a time course type of experiment. So overall, what we wanted to do here was to get a snapshot or a high-level idea as to what was happening at various time points with these various biomarkers, um, particularly the cytotoxicity. And we wanted to see what was happening with the cytotoxicity biomarker and if that was any indication of um, apoptosis detection in our well. So Katrin will be discussing Spark features later on in her talk, but I wanted to just briefly touch on some of the features of the instrument that we use for the applications that I'm talking about today. Uh, we first wanted to use the Spark as a cell culture incubator. So we use things like temperature control and gas control, which is CO2 in this case, um, for all of our experiments. So while the reader doesn't have a humidity pan necessarily like a cell culture incubator does, it does have a humidity cassette with a reservoir uh, that we used to incubate our plate in throughout the course of our experimentation. We utilize the top read luminescence detection feature, which we use to quantify light from our real-time glow assay as well as our caspase assay. And then we also use the bottom read fluorescence feature for cytotoxicity determination. And then lastly, we use the lid lifter, uh, which was really essential for not only the top read luminescence, but also to provide access to our plate for the injector, which again we use for the addition of our caspase glow reagent. So in the end, what we're looking to do is create a walkaway method of data generation. And what the slide here is showing you is basically the workflow that you would encounter if you were developing this application on your Spark Reader. So the first thing that you would do is you'd plate your cells. Um, and again, at the time of cell plating, you add your real-time glow and your cell tox green to your cell suspension. So those assays are already taken into account and added with your cells. You apply your treatment, and then you start measuring viability, which is luminescence and cytotoxicity, fluorescence, in real time. And then um, at various points, the apoptosis reagent gets injected. Again, the lid gets removed from the plate. Reagent is injected. Plate is incubated. Luminescence is again recorded um, to, detect, to, to measure the apoptosis activity, caspase activity 3.7. So for experimental setup, I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail um, on what we did here, but I wanted to mostly touch on some of the highlights that are really relevant to the experiment. And I also want to note that we do have an application note that we have developed for the application talked about today, and I'm going to reference that at the end of my portion of the talk today. So if you want to know any more of the little um, minute um, experimental details about what we did, you can certainly refer to that application note, and you'll find that information there. So the first thing um, we did for our first experiment to um, apply a serial titration of the various test compounds to our K562 cells. And our starting concentration was 100 micromolar, and we titrated down all the way to sub-micromolar levels, including a no-compound control. So the K562s were plated in a 3D4 well plate. And if you recall um, how I referred to the real-time glow assay earlier, um, we erred on the side of using slightly fewer cells, so 1,000 cells per well so that we have enough um, room there for the cells to grow and proliferate over time so that they do not consume all the um, real-time glow substrate throughout the course of our experiment. Now, it's important to note that um, due to the nature, the lytic nature of that caspase glow reagent, for our first experiment, uh, what we did is we did 
replicate titration series of all of these various te test compounds within the one 384 well assay plate. And that's going to help facilitate the time course with that lytic reagent. So once everything is assembled, we monitor viability and cytotoxicity every hour out to 72 hours. And then at various points in time, we dictated when that reagent was going to be injected by the spark. So around time zero or approximately, you know, within 30 minutes of compound addition. And then approximately every 8 to 12 hours afterwards out to 72 hours. So right now we're really just performing a time course experiment in really kind of a more traditional way. Um, once the reagent gets injected into the plate, the plate incubates inside of the plate reader for 30 minutes. I mean, it, it stays in the plate reader throughout the entirety of the experiment. Um, and then once that 30 minutes is up, the luminescence from that apoptosis assay is measured. So our slide here is showing you some representative results from one of our test compounds, which was ponatinib. In the first two graphs, you see an example of real-time data that's acquired with this compound, um, the treatment of K562 cells, uh, viability and cytotoxicity, respectively, and the points recorded every hour. And the last graph on the screen shows corresponding endpoint apoptosis assay results. Um, so we're showing you the apoptosis across the entire dose um, series at various points in time within our time course. And the data shown here are showing you fold change over an untreated control. So as you can see here, with the kinetic assays in particular, you get a lot of information. And I wanted to highlight just a few concentrations here to kind of walk you through what's happening. So if you um, concentrate on the blue line, um, which is our 100 micromolar concentration of panatinib, you'll notice right away that we see some immediate cytotoxicity happening with decreased viability. And you can see th that line on the viability graph, which is our real-time graph, as well as the cytotoxicity um, cell tox green graph in the middle. Um, you see a little bit of apoptosis, maybe um, an immediate um, reaction, immediate apoptosis happening at time zero or approximately 30 minutes after treatment, because we do see a slight spike in our um, caspase assay around that point in time. And now if you focus on the mid-range concentration, which is our red line or our 20 micromolar concentration, you'll notice that over the course of time we start to see some anti-proliferative effects happening, um, some moderate apoptosis, and then some membrane integrity changes are beginning to emerge. And lastly, the lower concentrations, so looking at the green line, which is 4 micromolar, and then everything below that, um, past 40 hours is where we really start to see more potent caspase 37 induction, and then those time-dependent changes in the cell viability and emerging secondary um, necrosis starting to happen with our cytotoxicity assay. So the time course treatment with the other test compounds showed that the detection of caspase 37 activity was correlated with K562 cytotoxicity and in some cases was transient in nature, as we did refer to in previous slides today. So here on the screen, I'm showing you the 100 micromolar concentration, which was our highest concentration tested. And we see here that um, the kinase inhibitors did induce an increase in cytotoxicity, which is shown as the black bars, and that over time that cytotoxicity increases the longer that those cells are exposed to the compound. Apoptosis, which is our caspase 37 activity, shown as the orange bars, was detectable in cases um, across the board here. In particular, we might see some um, apoptosis at the very beginning of our treatment, which could indicate fast-acting apoptosis, as shown in panel A, which is our bazutinib compound. And our other treatments, dasatinib, imatinib, and storosporine, displayed increasing um, caspase 37 activity over time, which also correlates with an increase in cytotoxicity. So it's important to note that pending the mechanism of action, apoptosis can take days to emerge, and that you'll notice if you look at the panels B through D in particular, um, that you see a time dependence on when caspase is detected and when it starts to um, degrade. So panel B and C show an example of apoptosis emerging at 48 hours and later, whereas panel D, our store sporing con 
compound, we see apoptosis emerge at 24 hours and then um, less apoptosis as time goes on. So really here what we're showing in addition is that the transient nature again of that caspase 37 detection as demonstrated by um, panel A and panel D where caspase activity is detected and then at later time points um, it less of that activity is detected. Observations from experiment one did show that membrane integrity changes correlated with apoptosis detection. We showed that early detection of cytotoxicity correlated with fast-acting apoptosis inducers, and this included bazutinib and possibly ponatinib at high concentration. We showed that delayed detection of cytotoxicity did correlate with more potent induction of apoptosis, and this was shown on the previous slide with storosporine, dasatinib, and imatinib. Now, when we looked at the data a little bit closer, particularly the cytotoxicity data from all of these apoptosis-inducing compounds, we did determine that when the relative fluorescence cytotoxicity assay reading with any dose of compound increased to approximately 1.2 to 1.4 times the untreated cell control, we were able to detect caspase 37 activity within those wells. And we started to call this a cytotoxicity told in what might identify a window for apoptosis detection that we could explore in subsequent experiments. So for our second round of experiments, we were interested in knowing whether or not we could use this change in cytotoxicity or this cytotoxicity threshold for apoptosis detection um, as a setting within the Spark software that would be used as a condition for automated injection of our caspase 37 reagent. So just as a little recap in our previous experiment, we were the ones that were dictating when the caspase reagent was added to the plate. And again, this is a little bit more of a traditional way of doing a time course experiment um, with those lytic reagents. But now for this next experiment, we wanted to see if the data would dictate when the caspase reagent was added to our assay plate. Plates were assembled in a similar manner for experiment two um, as they were for experiment one, only this time we adjusted the titration of our compound a little bit. We started at 20 micromolar concentration and decreased that a little bit from the previous experiment, which was 100 micromolar. And we did this to decrease the chance of immediate injection of our caspase 37 reagent to the plate due to an overt cytotoxic event. So here we're mainly interested in evaluating apoptosis induction and adjusted the concentrations a little bit accordingly. Also with this experiment, we did one titration series of each compound on the plate. We did not do replicate titrations as we did in our previous experiment. So the cytotoxicity threshold that we just um, referenced needs to be determined before each experiment. So prior to beginning the measurements, we determined the RFU background of our untreated control and then multiplied that number by 1.4 approximately to set our RFU cytotoxicity threshold within the software. Now, the cytotoxicity threshold works as an if-then condition. So if a well reaches cytotoxicity threshold or this certain RFU value, then the reagent gets injected into that entire dose series of compound. So the software requires a reference well for this threshold. So we use our highest concentration well within each series, which was 20 micromolar again in this case, as that reference. Just as before, all wells are monitored in real time for cytotoxicity and viability. Now, once that reference well within each compound series reaches that cytotoxicity threshold, the reagent gets injected to that entire series, the plate is incubated, and then luminescence is recorded. So some example data shown here for our bazutinib compound. Um, viability graph is shown on the left. 
cytotoxicity in the middle, and both graphs just like before showing data acquired in real time. Uh, the last graph shows the result from our apoptosis assay, caspase GLOW-37, which in this case was injected at 39 hours incubation with our dose series of bazutinib. So our 20 micromolar concentration, again, is, is highlighted here, particularly in the viability and the cytotoxicity graphs, because, again, that was our reference well for the automated injection of our caspase 37 reagent. So now if you look at the data a little more closer, um, our viability data, which concentrating on the red line here, um, we're seeing some anti-proliferative effects starting to occur at that 20 micromolar concentration, um, beginning at approximately 10 hours of incubation with our test compound. Cytotoxicity, which is the blue line, line um, shown in the middle graph, um, you see that over time that number starts to increase, so membrane starting to break down until it reaches our cytotoxicity threshold. So at 39 hours, threshold was achieved, at which point the apoptosis reagent was injected. So that last graph shows you the caspase 37 activity, and it was detected across the entire dose range of our compound at 39 hours. So you'll notice that with the 20 micromolar bazutinib compound um, in our caspase graph that at 39 hours, that highest concentration shows a hook in our data a little bit. Um, but that result kind of goes hand in hand with what we're seeing with our viability assay. And the viability assay is telling us that that high concentration is inducing an anti-proliferative effect. So what we think is happening here with that hook is that you have fewer cells there, so you're, in a sense, detecting less um, apoptosis. But if you use the viability result to normalize your apoptosis result, you can then see a more sigmoidal type of response. And that's what we see here with the darker green line in that last graph shown on the right. So this table summarizes the mechanism of action for all the compounds that we tested. And again, four of our compounds are BCR-ABLE targeted inhibitors. Uh, one compound, which is storosporine, is a pan-kinase inhibitor. And then ionomycin is our cytotoxicity control. It's um, a calcium ionophore known to induce necrosis. So what we show here in this chart, um, you'll see next to the mechanism of action, we've got a time of injection. And the time of injection, again, is when the reference well within each of these compounds reached that cytotoxicity threshold and the reagent was added. And then shown in the last two columns are the apoptosis and the viability assay results for the corresponding compounds. So for apoptosis, the larger the number that you see there, the greater the magnitude of the apoptosis in that um, sample at that point in time. For viability, the smaller the number, the fewer cells present um, at that time of injection. So with storosporine and the BCR-ABLE targeted inhibitors, um, we see that there's detectable apoptosis at the time of reagent injection. Um, Panatinib was um, a little bit different, but we think that data kind of corresponds to what we showed earlier in the presentation. Um, if you recall, um, the Panatinib results, um, they're really kind of in, court, in accordance with what we, we saw previously. Um, the 20 micromolar concentration um, showed an anti-proliferative effect, which we saw before, and there was mild cytotoxicity happening, maybe a little bit of apoptosis, um, but we really didn't see that until like 40 hours. So here what we think happened at 14 hours, um, we're seeing a little bit more membrane integrity change, uh, which triggered the injection of the caspase 37 reagent. Um, but we think that with some increased time, we would be able to detect apoptosis in that sample. And then lastly, our ionomycin, our necrosis control, again, it's a calcium ionophore known to induce necrosis and not apoptosis. We're showing here that injection of, of the caspase reagent happens pretty quickly because that compound is toxic and it induces membrane integrity changes very soon after exposure. So we see um, no um, apoptosis there and um, a little bit of a decrease in viability. So. In the end, we concluded that, you know, for proof of concept that it appears that the cytotoxicity threshold did work and that we were able to use this conditional injection of reagent to confirm the mechanism of action of our various test compounds. So in conclusion, 
Um, the Promega cell health assays and the SPARC um, support mechanistic toxicity determination with data acquisition over multiple days. Um, we use a cytotoxicity measurement to dictate the time of caspase 37 reagent injection. Automated caspase 37 reagent injection is achieved through the use of the lid lifting feature and a fluorescent cytotoxicity threshold for injection that we used within the reader software. And that lastly, the onset of cytotoxicity can be used to identify this window of apoptosis detection to ultimately ensure proper assignment of a drug's mode of action or mechanism of action. So here is the resource slide that I had alluded to earlier in the presentation. Please feel free to check out um, our website, promega.com, tcan.com. I've included some um, information here on product numbers if you wanted to look at the technical manuals for the various assays um, discussed today. And then very important here is that application note that I talked about um, on the TCAN website. You can get more information about the application discussed here, um, some of the um, details on the experiments, and find a little bit more out about the Spark instruments that Kotrin will be speaking about next. Thank you, Tracy, for this really interesting summary of the results of your experiments. I am happy that you were able to successfully perform all these assays with the Spark and utilize the instrument's functions in so many ways. So with the next few slides, I would now like to give you an overview of the Spark's most important functions and features, specifically those which are designed for cell-based applications. So here we have the Spark Reader family, the Spark 10M on the left side and the Spark 20M on the right side. Um, there is no strict separation line between these two readers. Um, you could say that the Spark 20M is sort of the big brother of the 10M. It's more of a high-end detection platform with the 1536 well reading capability, um, improved fluorescence sensitivity for high throughput screening applications, while the 10M is more of a mid-range reader for academic research for assay development and medium throughput applications in 6 to 384 well plates. The Spark readers have been designed as multi-modular readers. They can be, they offer uh, many different functions and features that can be more or less freely combined. The Spark, of course, is able to do all the standard measurement modes like fluorescence, luminescence, adsorbance, and in addition, it comes with many accessories and additional functions uh, that can be combined according to the experimenters, experimentator's needs. Of course, the Spark can do all um, the fluorescence-related measurement modes like FRET, TRFRET, and TRF. It can read alpha screen. It can read fluorescence polarization, but it also has some features that are specifically designed with cell-based applications in mind. I've highlighted some of the cell features and functions um, of the Spark on this slide here. Of course, uh, most of the adherent cell types um, are analyzed through the well bottom using a fluorescence bottom reading mode. Um, the Spark also offers humidity control, as Tracy has mentioned, um, using the patent pending humidity cassette. It has a shaking function to keep floating cells in suspension. It has an incubation function where cell samples can be kept at a certain target temperature. It offers integrated gas control to um, control levels of CO2 and O2 inside the measurement chamber. It offers injectors that can be used to directly um, inject cells into the well, so direct seeding of cells into the microplate. It has a very elaborate temperature control function, not only above ambient temperature, so not only heating of the instrument, but also cooling below ambient temperature. It has a really useful cell imaging module, a camera module that can be used either for cell counting and viability assessment or for direct imaging to determine the confluence of a cell culture. And all of these 
measurements can be done in kinetic mode, so over a prolonged period of time to monitor the response of a certain cell type in a time-dependent manner. So let's take a closer look at some of the cell features of the SPARC. In contrast to the previous reader series by TKEN, the Infinity Readers, um, which could be equipped with external gas control modules, the SPARC readers now have an integrated uh, gas regulation for the control of CO2 and O2 levels inside the measurement chamber. These two gases can be regulated independently or they can be regulated simultaneously. Gas control in general during long-term cell assays helps to mimic physiological conditions by maintaining environmental conditions that are very close to what cells experience in an incubator. That means even during a long-term experiment, cells can grow um, without any hindrances. Um, you can see this here on, in, in the graph on the lower right side of this slide here. Um, the green line representing a Spark 10M compared to um, a reader without any gas control or a sample without any gas control. And you can see that with the gas control of the Spark, the cells can grow um, continuously over a period of almost 60 hours, while the cells that have no CO2 supply in this case um, stop growing after a certain period of time and eventually die. The patent pending humidity cassette is designed to reduce evaporation in standard microplates. It minimizes so-called edge effects, which are common problems um, during long-term experiments when fluid evaporation occurs in the border wells. Um, there are some dedicated plate types that have fluid reservoirs around and in between the wells to create a humid microatmosphere um, to maintain a more or less constant volume uh, of the sample fluid inside the wells over time. However, these plates are very expensive in most cases, so in the range of $20 per plate uh, or even more, and they are single use. So this is why uh, we developed a humidity cassette, um, which is compatible with every SBS standard microplate. So there is no need to switch to a dedicated and costly microplate type. Um, you can simply use your current or already validated plate type or plate formats. The humidity cassette can be used in combination with all the detection modes of the Spark reader, um, so you can freely combine it uh, with any type of readout you would like to use. The handling is also very easy. The measurement plate um, is placed into the humidity cassette and the reservoirs of the cassette are filled with either distilled water or a buffer. Um, and as the lid of the humidity cassette is closed at all times during the measurement, except the readout itself, the humid microatmosphere can be maintained over even a multi-day period. The fluid reservoir can also be filled up again um, during exceptionally long reads over several days, just in case this is needed. And after, after use, the humidity cassette can be cleaned really easily, either with ethanol, um, in an ultrasonic bath or even in an autoclave. So it's um, reusable and uh, can be combined with any type of microplate you want to use. When the humidity cassette is used for experiments, there is a special technical solution inside the reader that allows for removing the lid of the cassette at the time of the actual readout. The integrated lid lifter is another patent pending feature that enables workflow automation for cell-based and other assays. So it consists of a little magnet inside the instrument that automatically attaches to and lifts the lid of the humidity cassette or any other microplate lid during the readout and for reagent injection. So you can have optimal evaporation protection by leaving the lid on your test plate during your long-term run and still don't lose sensitivity because the lid can be removed automatically exactly at the time of measurement. And it will be placed back on the plate once the readout is done. And as I said, the lid lifter can be used in combination with any microplate, even if it has a plastic lid. The only thing you have to do is to stick a specially designed um, sticky metal disc 
uh, onto the plastic lid of your microplate so that the magnet can grip it and lift it. Um, and it will be compatible, so you have made your plate compatible with the lid lifter by doing this. So especially when you're performing critical luminescence or absorbance-based applications where best possible assay background reduction is key, lid lifting can significantly improve the measurement sensitivity. Another highly useful function is the camera module that is installed in the Spark readers. It can be used for three key applications, cell counting, cell viability assessment, and confluence. The first two applications are done in a special accessory, the slide adapter that comes with this instrument feature. It has the same footprint as a standard microplate and can therefore be placed conveniently on the instrument's plate carrier and used in the same way as a standard microplate. For cell counting, the cell suspensions are pipetted into the so-called cell chips, which are little disposable plastic slides with two independent chambers. These cell chips are then placed into the slide adapter and counted automatically by the Spark software, um, where you have a little one-click app that will show you the detected cell number, the average size, and other relevant parameters. And for viability assessment, the suspension can be stained with trypan blue, which is a common dye to discriminate viable and dead cells. And again, the software algorithm will detect the number of white and blue cells to discriminate alive and dead cells and summarize the results in a report file. You can see um, a picture of the slide adapter here on the la left side of um, this, this slide. Uh, we have four positions for cell chips, and each of these cell chips has two positions for samples, either for replicates of the same sample or for higher throughput, um, you can use these two sample spots independently of each other. The latest addition to the imaging-based functions of the Spark is cell confluence assessment. Confluence is the percentage of cell-covered area on a certain growth surface. In the Spark, it can be measured directly in the microplate in 6 to 96 well plates. Um, without the need to harvest the cells beforehand. So it can be done directly um, in the cell cultures in the microplate well. It has, um, the function has automated well border detection for even more precise measurements, which is especially useful when you are working with low cell numbers or applications like single cell cloning. The confluence well value can be used to normalize any other cell associates, associated signal. For example, um, as the graph here on the right side shows um, a correlation between cell-associated GFP signal and confluence over a period of uh, multiple days. Uh, so this is a standard way to use the confluence function as a way of normalizing um, cell-related signals to the growth of the cells. We currently also have some ongoing cooperations with a focus on testing the confluence function um, for cell migration uh, and for wound healing, um, which will be uh, published as soon as we have finished these cooperations. Also, the previous TKEN readers had um, a well-established injector system that was compatible with uh, most uh, fluids and, um, uh, and reagents. Um, we have taken the injector system of the Spark to the next level by combining the injector box that is placed on top of the instrument with a heating and steering function. So that means cells can be maintained in suspension and at a certain tar target temperature, uh, mostly 37 degrees for most eukaryotic cell lines. Um, and furthermore, cells can be automatically injected into the microplate wells using this injector system. So to improve seeding uniformity um, for your cell cultures um, is quite easy using the Spark's injector system that provides a comparable start condition for all your experiments by improving the seeding uniformity. And of course, the entire injector box can be used in a light-protected way um, to protect any light-sensitive or light-susceptible um, substances or any um, cells that are susceptible to photobleaching or so.
So we now heard, um, and we now had an overview of the most important features of the Spark for cell-based applications. So to summarize this quickly again, with the Spark readers, you can create more reliable and re reproducible data by automating and standardizing your cell workflows. You can increase your scientific throughput by producing measurement results 24 hours a day, seven days a week, during the nights, over the weekend, so the reader can do the work for you. You can save money, of course, by freeing time for other research while the reader is tending to your essays and to your measurements. And you can gain access to new application fields by utilizing the instrument's modularity and upgradability. And if you want to learn more about the Spark Reader family, either the 10M or the 20M, please have a look at our website, www.tcan.com, um, for more information about the Spark and its cell functions. Thank you very much, Catherine and Tracy. I'm sure you will all agree that there were some excellent points raised during the presentation. We've had a number of questions, so I'll move straight on to these. Can I use the confluence function to determine the cell number? I think that's a question for me. So um, confluence is technically not the same thing as cell number. Different cell lines can have a different individual size and will therefore reach a total confluence on a, growth, uh, on a given growth area earlier or later than other cells. Um, for example, if you look at HUVEC cells, they will typically have a diameter of 12 to 15 micrometers, while HeLa cells, which are very popular cell type, are closer to 20 micrometers. So that means if you have a 100% confluent well of HUVEC cells, that will have almost twice the number of cells as a 100% confluent well of HeLa cells. So what can be done to determine the approximate cell number is to use your cell line of interest and create a standard curve. This is something that is always highly recommended. So with this standard curve, you can correlate confluence and cell number at the time of seeding because naturally you know um, the number of cells that you have put into a certain well at the time of seeding. And when the cells have settled and adhered, you can measure the confluence and note down how many cells give which percentage of confluence. Um, so, of course, it's recommended to do this with replicates um, to have a higher reliability. Um, and very importantly, you have to do this individually for each cell type you want to use because of the above mentioned reason. Um, so, you can correlate confluence and cell number, but you cannot directly um, get information about the cell number just by reading the, the confluence of a cell sample. Thank you very much. The next question that we've had is, if I perform a long-term cell experiment over several days, what needs to be considered when selecting the environmental control factors of the spark, such as temperature and gas control? Mm -hmm. Well, for, first of all, it's important to know the environmental control parameters that are suitable for your cell line. So most eukaryotic cell types will require CO2 levels between 5 and 10 percent, and of course, a typical temperature of 37 degrees for optimal growth. Um, these parameters can be easily set on the spark readers. You just have to make sure that the external CO2 supply is sufficient for the entire readout period. So if you want to perform a measurement over two, three, four days, uh, you have to make sure that your gas bottle has enough gas volume left for the entire period. Um, one more thing, the Spark has an injector port on top of the instrument, and it's very important to seal this or to close this during the readout with um, an injector dummy um, to avoid any gas loss. And regarding the temperature, um, the instrument, as I said, is able to maintain a temperature um, above ambient temperature very easily. So as long as the ambient temperature doesn't exceed, say, 33 degrees, if you want to perform the measurement um, at, uh, at 37 degrees, you should be fine. Uh, with the Spark 20M, you can now also use the cooling function, which is called the so-called T-Cool module. 
um, that can be used to downregulate the temperature below ambient temperature. Uh, this is highly useful for, for better results consistency. Um, as we know from some assays, the temperature-dependent signal variations uh, can sometimes be as high as 10% per degree Celsius, um, especially for enzyme assays or highly temperature-sensitive assays. And with the T-Cool module, um, any effects like instrument heating up during the measurement period can be counteracted. Uh, so it lets you perform your assays at a stable temperature throughout the entire readout period, and you're getting comparable results regardless of when you perform your assay. So you get the same um, quality of results in winter and in summer, regardless of temperature variations in your lab. Thank you very much, Katrin and Tracy. Just to remind everybody, any questions that we didn't have time to get to will be answered offline as soon as possible. The webinar will now be made available on demand. If you have any friends or colleagues that you think may be interested in this webinar or any future events, please feel free to share the link. Thanks again for your time.